Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, asking that you would strip away all foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. We just thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege that we have to feast upon your word. It is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The passage that we are studying, if you've been following along in this series of videos, we come to Romans chapter 6, and it doesn't contain any uh, magic shortcut or you know, miracle cure for the treatment of a despondent Christian life, or a life burdened by the guilt of sin, or, or some quick solution for the one who is living in bondage to the law. Uh, bondage to the old self, the old man, but it does offer the real solution, the real solution. What we are being shown here through the passage that we've come to here in our study, what we are learning here can introduce hungry hearts to the truth and the provision that God has waiting for them if they should decide to pursue it. For many Christians, this solution has brought speedy and dramatic changes. I've seen the changes take place almost overnight. For others, however, greater time was involved, which is normally the case. But should any born again believer in Jesus Christ truly consider the text that we're looking at, he can be assured that his life will never be the same again. The Holy Spirit will make sure of that. Now, here's what our text says. I'm going to go ahead and read this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? I'm reading from the authorized version, by the way. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him, for he, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is where we've come in our text, and we've seen a lot of marvelous truth laid out in the previous five chapters. Uh, if you have been following this series. I went through that a couple of videos ago, just an enormous amount of wonderful, marvelous, mind-blowing uh, truth, realities that we were presented with that bring us to a solid, sure standing in Christ where the, we've been forgiven, we've been justified, made righteous, in Christ, uh, given access to God's grace, and the list just went on and on, where that grace abounded even the more. And 
none of which had we had any uh, there was any synergism involved there's no cooperation in, in these these were things that God did we didn't we didn't do it God did it and what we are now looking at is a passage in which we had nothing to do with either I cannot emphasize the fact enough that there's no synergism in the passage that we're looking at here we don't crucify ourselves we don't put ourselves to death we don't die with Christ we don't it's not that we should must ought to be dead to sin or dead to self the text dearly beloved says that God did it that's what it says now I've spent a lot of time this is one of my favorite passages I've spent a lot of time on on this I ask you to look at the solution that the Holy Spirit just presented here as the solution regarding the constant hindrance of the old man and and what he did not submit to us as a solution and that is our trying to clean up the old man who has been crucified with Jesus Christ which in the main is is the main thrust of modern Christianity we know that spiritual growth leads the hungry Christian farther into the Word of God and even in ever greater involvement in the very life of Christ himself but just how do we grow after being introduced to everything that we've been told in the previous chapters and and now the passage that we just read I meet Christians every day and I'm sure many of you also do too who who were overflowing with abundant joy in their Lord during the early days of their Christian lives what could have possibly happened to cause such a change in those lives this passage this crucial passage is dealing with the hard as concrete stone cold truth of our old ugly self the sin nature the flesh life that which lies in stark contrast to who we are in Christ the passage folks this passage of Scripture is showing us in graphic detail how that God has elected how he chose to deal with the issue of the sin nature we have our way and he has his and that is by giving it a death blow putting self to death with Christ not that we should but that he did it's important that we know this because many are unaware of this marvelous fact they live their lives in constant frustration because of the sin in their lives not realizing that they've been crucified with Christ it is my prayer that these studies will help address this sad situation along with the people the circumstances and the error that caused such harm and ruin so I have spent considerable time trying to formulate a way to present what I believe are situations that most of us can relate to in this matter of, of the old sinful fleshly carnal nature Adamic nature that God left us with when he made us new creations in Christ he didn't eradicate it he crucified it so I ask you to bear with me through a few things first and then we'll take a closer look at the passage that we've that we just read that we've come to here in Romans chapter 6 so bear with me uh, for just a bit 
Do you begin each day more weakened and hungry than ever? Do you, do you attend church out of a sense of commitment and obligation? Well, I just got to be there. Or crawl out of bed only to exist the remainder of the day feeling guilty for something that you did in the past or are presently doing that you wish that you had not done or wish that you could stop doing. Do you ever find yourself planted in church when you really don't want to be there? And just how gracious is your experience once you arrive? Do you look around you at all the other Christians who, who seem to be satisfied and wonder if there's something wrong with you? Could it be that they have some secret formula that they haven't shared with you? Do you feel that God's approval of you is based upon your performance? Does your performance desperately need some new strategy that will promise results? Deep within your very soul, do you feel that something is just not right? And how about your service for God? Does inability plague your service? thereby causing guilt and frustration in your relationship with Christ. Perhaps you find yourself in a, in a slow march through Death Valley in an effort to reach that level of prayer life that you desire. That must be the answer for your failure, you know, for, because it doesn't seem that God is really helping you live the Christian life. Your life is just riddled with all of these emotions and all of these thoughts. Perhaps you entertain the thought that should God really answer your prayers, well, then he most assuredly would be helping you live the life that he says that he expects of you. <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, after all, doesn't he help others? For him not to to answer your prayers for help must mean, well, that must mean that he considers you completely unworthy. When you think of him and, and how he must think of you, do you only sense confusion? Perhaps your most repeated prayer is for his assistance in, in, in enabling you to do better. Just help me, Lord, do better. Or is prayer just one channel of communication into which you just can't seem to enter into at all? Did you know that our Approval from God is only because we have been accepted in the Beloved, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.6. That's the basis. Perhaps the only time that you find for prayer is when condemnation builds up in your life to a point of, of forcing confession. Maybe you find yourself confessing all day long. Or do you just avoid talking to God in prayer, like you, kind of like you, you know, would avoid talking to your boss on the on the telephone? Do you feel that prayer is powerful only if your conduct is acceptable to God? You have to qualify somehow. I mean, be honest now. Have you ever even come to the point of praying for a better prayer life? And when it comes to Bible study itself, I mean, do you have problems there too? With over, with over 500, 500, yeah, I know that sounds a lot, but that's true. English translations alone, 
you may have the dilemma of deciding just which one is the right one or which one works, which one God approves of, those he doesn't approve of. You, you might just find yourself never knowing whether to trust all of them or none of them. And folks, I got to tell you that you are not alone. Not alone. There are a vast number of Christians who are living in abject frustration. They've discovered a number of passages in their Bible where they feel that they feel contradicts other scriptures. That just that tension alone there causes frustration and and a lack of interest in Bible study altogether. The Bible that they have, the one that they carry around, just doesn't seem to read the same way as their pastors does. Now, perhaps you don't personally have that problem. But you still, you can't seem to have victory in applying its teachings to your life. When your Bible teaches Christian service, do you understand the nature of of your personal responsibility in accomplishing all of that work. Do you finally end up discouraged time and time again? Does the Bible seem to be a tough manual of instructions that's just impossible to follow? You know, kind of like those instructions that, that they write it out in Chinese, you know, Throughout it all, does God appear to just not be alive in your experience? And what about faith? What about faith? Does faith seem to be beyond your grasp? Far from reassuring? Did you start out this way? That's my question. Are you finding fulfillment in everyone or everything other than Jesus Christ? Are you trying to walk in his shoes only to find out that your feet just don't fit? Yet you're convinced, you're convinced that there's something more, something more, much more to it all. It is possible through your misdirected attempts to discover the key to effective Christian living, that you have forgotten why you accepted Christ in the first place. Sadder yet, perhaps you never knew why you accepted, accepted him at all. Folks, should any of this describe your present Christian life? Please do not be troubled. The simplicity of Christ in you is what changes Christian lives. If you find yourself struggling in meaningless and self-defeating Christian activities, just know that God has you right there for a purpose. He's working to draw you into an understanding of who you are in Christ and what he has done on your behalf. How in the world did you ever get to this place when you started out so well? You started out well. Just when did you first realize that your new, exciting life in Christ had lost some of its joy? Think, think back. What really happened to cause you to end up feeling so confused, depressed, hurt, despondent, unworthy, and defeated? The answer lies in those early days of your new life in Christ. Can you remember back to the first flush of your salvation when joy and happiness flooded your life? And think of how you seized every opportunity that you could 
to be with God's people whenever and wherever. Yet somehow that all changed. Remember when the teachings of Jesus were hurled at you as though you were an enemy of God? Or you were indicted for your failure to live up to all that the Bible said that the righteous must do, you know, to enter into his kingdom. How about the worship services at the church? Did you find yourself feeling guilty that, that you didn't give as much as the others gave when they passed around the offering plate? Did you try to shrink down into your pew whenever a call came from the pulpit for workers to serve in the church? Just how spiritual did you feel when you were called upon to read one verse out of this book and you couldn't find it? You had to turn to the index and in front of your Bible while everybody waited impatiently for you to find it. Do you recall the home Bible studies that you attended during those early years where, where close prayer groups would pray for each other? How much joy in the Lord did you sense when the others would pray that the Lord lead you to do what you really should be doing or for him to lead you to, to quit doing those things that you really shouldn't be doing. Did you feel that you measured up to their opinion of what a good Christian should look and act like? And how about that time? How about the time that the well-meaning brother or sister shared with you that your kind of music that you love to listen to is actually demonic and that your involvement in it disgraced God? And how about those special meetings at the church? How special were they to you? How large a knot grew in the pit of your stomach when the, the visiting missionary challenged you to confess to God that you had been avoiding God's call to Christian ministry in the mission field. Or just how guilty did you feel when, when the leading men of your church walk the aisle to rededicate their lives to Christ and you just sat there. How about that special revival and evangelism emphasis week at your church? Where did your joy in the Lord go that first night? Do you remember the, the night that 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 fiery evangelist asked for a show of hands of all those who had led ten souls to the Lord that day? Five souls? Two souls? Well, how about just one soul? And you couldn't even raise your hand for one soul. Just how guilty did you feel when you knew that you had let your Lord down? Or start avoiding direct eye-to-eye -eye contact with those who had yet to do anything as sinful as what you knew that you had done? 
I can go on and on, but are you beginning to see how you got to the place where that you are now? Let me ask you this. Just how much of that pressure was brought into your life by the Lord himself? You should have said none. But most likely, you did not. In fact, chances are that you still can't identify the differences between the beautiful work of the Holy Spirit and the futile failure of the flesh, your old self. But don't feel alone. This is where millions, and I'm not exaggerating, of Christians are at. Many Christians are in a conflict they themselves cannot overcome. This grave conflict is the vain struggle of the self-life, which has gone on from the time of our physical birth until our new birth in Christ and beyond. Self is the self of our text is the old man, the sin nature, the flesh, the old self. In fact, everything about us that opposes the will and the work of God in and through our lives, it is manifest in, in numerous ways in the Christian's life. The most common show of self is that it seeks to Im improve a believer's standing before God by what it can do itself. In, in Christian circles today, most well-intentioned believers are unaware of the very existence of the self-life within. Yet coming to a biblical understanding of the self-life inside of us can promise and secure rest for the weary, defeated believer. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to see us to see here. There, there can be little genuine spiritual growth in the life of the believer until he's able to receive what Scripture says about self. Self has positively no righteous function in the Christian's life. None. And how sad it is that the majority of believers are unaware of the fact that that the answer to the travesty of self is not struggling harder, but the person of Jesus Christ himself. He actually takes the sincere heart through this painful struggling process in order to expose self's uselessness and then later grants that believer rest. Crucified with Christ. Buried and raised with him to walk in newness of life. You know, the believer's greatest difficulty is in realizing that self is an utter failure when it outwardly it appears to possess such potential. Folks in the flesh dwells no good thing. And few things seem to attack sound reasoning more than for one to advocate a believer not exercise self-effort. I mean, after all, you know, shouldn't a Christian try the best that he possibly can? Isn't he to, to put out more effort when he's not doing good enough? I mean, surely practice makes perfect, right? Right. Folks, listen to me. These seeming truisms may seem logical to the natural reasoning, but they do not, absolutely do not, 
do not apply to the Christian life. You cannot improve something that cannot be improved. If God thought you, that was the case, he wouldn't have crucified self. In the most simple of terms, self's potential could best be described as the incapability of human improvement. A fallen and sinful nature that can do nothing but fail. That's, that's the very essence of self that he crucified. This nature cannot be improved upon, nor can it ever be perfected. Self, folks, is that hideous entity within that by its domineering nature, it prohibits the new creation in Christ from expressing itself. And yet, but when self is discovered and put in its rightful place on the cross where it belongs, Struggling and frustration subside. Only upon discovering the true nature of the self-life can a believer experience victory over sin, cultivate appropriate desires towards service, and gain rest within his very soul. I've mentioned this before on occasion, in fact, a number of times. Scripture, this book, folks, it is not a book of instructions to the believer on how to live the Christian life, but it's primarily the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. If you're hoping to be better or, or acceptable to God, then you're failing to see yourself in Christ only. And to see yourself as having been made the righteousness of God in Christ. If you are ever disappointed with yourself, you've only believed in yourself. It's been said that discouragement is unbelief that God has a purpose and a plan, a blessing for you. There is never any room for pride to reside. That's all about the flesh. Because we don't have any standing before God in ourselves. We don't, we don't preach devotion first and blessing second. That is reversing God's order. It's preaching law, not grace. And I am telling you that if all you hear Sunday after Sunday is someone in the pulpit or, or some person on some social network platform or someone else, someone close to you badgering you to try harder, then you're being driven away from Christ, not to him. Folks, you did not begin your life in Christ like this. Nor did you begin your life in Christ with all of the problems that I'm describing. No, it was heaped upon you by others. Many of them well-intentioned, ignorant, though, however. I hardly know how to put all this in words. Just why was it? Why was it that your early Christian life was devoid of many of these current problems? Why? Because you, because folks, you were focused on God's grace. But, but what happened? Your present trouble did not begin until others began to heap responsibilities upon you, which you were never equipped required or intended to carry. Think of, think of the babe in Christ and the mature saint. He's been a Christian for 50 years telling the babe in Christ who hasn't known Jesus Christ, walked with Jesus Christ for more than two days. 
putting him on the same level, having the same expectations of that young babe in Christ as he would a fellow 50-year-old saint. That, that, I, I, one of my pet peeves is Christians who just don't think. So, so what happened? Slowly you began to use your, your old self to try to earn God's unmerited grace. Then soon before you knew it, you were back under the full dominion of the old self that died with Christ at Calvary. Our present text. And I hurt. I hurt for these people, for people, God's people that have gone through the... Self is described by, by many different names. One of the most common designations used is the singular form of the word sin. Whenever the singular sin is used, sin singular, it almost always means sin nature or self. Another very common term used for self, especially by the Apostle Paul, is flesh. Again, with very few exceptions, Paul uses the term flesh to mean the old self, the old man, the old self, or sin nature that we inherited through Adam. We looked at that in Romans chapter 4. And this was the problem. Folks, this was the problem at Galatia. The introduction of circumcision into the church for the uncircumcised Gentiles for salvation. Yet the Holy Spirit so worded most of the epistle in such a manner as to have it address any activity, any activity or any practice that would have a believer either gain or maintain righteousness by the exercise of of that practice. If any righteousness comes by the law, that, that, that's performing to a, a given standard or requirement, then folks, Christ died needlessly. Therefore, our use of this epistle has full authority by God for this given purpose. Galatians has been used heavily due to its clear and, and graphic statements concerning self-effort versus the Christ life. It's where we read that we were crucified with him. Kind of a parallel passage to our present study. Those of you who are, who are former military, you know that early warning is the best defense against uh, any attack. When the plans, the means, and the methods of an enemy are known, a strong defense can be devised. Few pulpits. Very few. Very few pulpits are warning their flocks of the lethal danger of self and the law. And as a result, as a result, most Christians are now living in spiritual adultery. Are you one of those? I mean, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Great. But I hope you haven't stopped there. You desperately need to have him as your life As your Savior, your Redeemer, he began, he, be, he became your sin. And, but that was only one half of his great design for your life. When you were born again, it was essential that you clearly understood that the sin issue was entirely dealt with. That sin was no longer an issue. Yet now, and just as important, it is crucial that, that you understand how the issues 
of practical and, and positional righteousness apply to your new life? What we are learning as we're going through Romans here, what we are seeing is how God is laying all this out. That God put all your sin on Christ. Then he put the righteousness of Christ on you. Then he, he took your old man and crucified him. Many believers have no understanding of these, mar these marvelous, God, I don't even have a, a good word to describe. Marvelous isn't good enough, a word. Christians ex put forth tremendous effort to try to work out their own righteousness. There are those who acknowledge that they possess his righteousness, yet they continue to live their lives in a state of spiritual adultery. They falsely assume that enough has already been done, you know, in their positional standing before God. That's it. He died for my sins. Now he's just left the rest up to me. And I just, it's kind of like I'm, I'm born again by grace, but I live by law. They, they erroneously conceive that their Christian lives are complete because their sins were removed and Christ's righteousness bestowed. And, and that's it. They, they, now they can just go on and just keep the Ten Commandments. Or they can go on and just live under the law. They couldn't be further from the truth, folks. The Christian life and, and the growth process is never completed in this life, That, for one thing. And for a Christian to stop growing is for that Christian to die, to die, but we don't abandon, we don't kick grace out of our life to go back to law after we become a Christian. Surely the greatest misconception of the Christian life, I think I, it tends to fasten itself onto to the to the post salvation experience. This this misconception it assumes that the believer is in sort of a a God designed fixed state of maturity, whereby he's he's eligible he's kind of he qualifies he's eligible to receive help in in in, in uh, the old man help God God just help my old man you know. It's all about self-dependence. It's all about self-dependence and self-worth and self-will and self, 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 self. Christians are just so full of self. The very thing that our text is telling us God crucified with Christ, that he put to death, so that we might walk in newness of life, his life. And this wrong thinking makes the actual truth a very difficult light to see. These Christians are conditioned to believe that God, Christ did his part, now the rest is up to me. And the spiritual adultery is the atrocity of being espoused to Christ while having an endless affair with the law. Christ is the end of the law to those who believe on him as their life. If you are a spouse to Christ, then you must not flirt with attempts to accomplish your own righteousness, which basically amounts to you trying to clean up the old man. It was through the obedience of Christ that the sum total of all your sin was dealt with by Christ. Therefore, you can never become any more sinful or any less righteous by what you yourself do. A serious problem develops when a Christian tries to cover the symptom of his sin nature through empty, frustrated efforts to produce more righteousness. And should he attempt to do this, he will fail to recognize his position in Christ concerning both justification and sanctification. The common error is, is, is to read justification into sanctification passages of Scripture. So, and, and the result of that is that we, we, we come out, we wind up looking at Scripture as mainly instructions 
on salvation and, and subsequently, you know, how to live out that salvation. And it's it's really it's it's so natural. It's just it's it's nothing more than a computer manual. Okay, just read it and do it. And precious truths describing how a Christian appropriates the very life of Christ himself are ignored. We can easily understand what's expected of us in our Christian walk, but it, it requires careful observation to understand just how that this is accomplished. And since most Christians fail to understand the how, well, they're well, their only recourse is just to pick up the ball and run with it, you know, to blindly perform. Thus, they fall back on the only solution that they see available to them, which is the law. The law is the very ordinance that they were directed to avoid. Or they seek to, to mix law and grace. And, you know, this they do. They attempt to do that in, in a frustrated effort to accomplish all, all of the... the the instructions and all that the exhortations of, of Scripture seem to require them to do. This is such a vital, important passage that we're going through. I, I don't. I wish I could spend months on it. I really do. You live under the law, folks. You're going to discover with certainty just how devastating the effort really can be. Because that futile undertaking, it doesn't impart life, nor does it afford you any peace. The tragic truth is that it actually steals away your confidence and it steals away your joy. Sound familiar? Wasn't this the very avenue that your joy took to, to flee from you? Go back to the beginning, folks. Back to the beginning. Your whole affection was set upon Christ. The entire object of our faith is Christ Jesus and, and our ongoing relationship with Him. Do we know Him more intimately if we try and be the best Christian that we can be? Hardly. I know that doesn't go over too well to the ears of most modern Christians. Does he smile on us with approval when we ask for his help to accomplish righteousness through the old man? Absolutely not. No. No. Thousand times no. Christ desires to take the place of our struggling self that is both incompetent and unworthy, that is unworthy of anything other than death. Can we just stop there? Can we just stop? And think about that word for a moment. Dead is dead. Last I checked, dead meant dead was a pretty serious thing. Well, folks, I'm out of time. Next video, we're going to get into looking at more closely at the grammar, the meanings of words, and the grammar of the text. I love you all. I truly do. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for the opportunity to, that you've given me to to ramble and for us to to look at your word here again i just give you all the credit and all the glory for all that you are and are doing in our lives i just ask that you would strip away all foolishness but seal to our hearts that which is truth for it's in christ's name i pray amen i love you all i truly do thanks for watching